Would you mind, I'd love for us to just stand for the reading of God's word together. I want to also welcome all of our campuses watching online and anyone watching online as well. Um, we're going to read Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 6. And I always like to stand to read the word because I just feel God is speaking to us today. Can I get an amen? amen? So even though we look back at Matthew, when Jesus said at the time, those words carry true uh, to this generation today. So let's read the first six verses and then we'll pray and then we'll get into our word. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. It's living and it's active. Thank you, Lord, that your word speaks to us each individually as well as collectively. And I pray, Lord, that we would open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to receive what your Holy Spirit wants to say this morning to your people. And God, like John the Baptist prayed, may we decrease and you increase. And Lord, for my words, I pray that my words and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to you, God. Whatever you want to do with the notes that I have prepared, I pray your Holy Spirit would take them. And Lord, do what you desire to do. Help us to get out of your way, Lord. And I pray you would fill us all just freshly with your Holy Spirit. We need you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may have a seat. How many of you have been watching the Olympics? Right? Just, it's, it ends today, and it's been exciting to watch all of the events, the track and field, and I'm a huge basketball fan, so I love Team USA winning yesterday. It was amazing. And it doesn't matter what event there was, because there's a six-hour gap, a lot of the events happen way before they come on prime time. So maybe for some of you, if you're not watching sports reels during the day, you're watching at prime time the track and field, and you're hoping, I hope Team USA, whatever your country is, wins the gold medal. But in a lot of ways, it happened already. It's just prime time is actually broadcasting it as real time. So my wife, for example, she... She's in a field where she can't, like, look at the news, so she would get home, and I go, do you know who won the 100 meters? She's like, don't tell me. But I watch, like, I'll connect to ESPN. I'll just watch little sports reels during the day. So I already know who won. So a lot of times my wife is watching. She goes, oh, I think she's going to lose. I think she's going to lose. And, and in my mind, I'm, like, going crazy because I know she won. Like, I know it turns out okay, like she won the gold. The reason why I use that analogy is as Jesus is approaching the cross, there's some things that he's preparing his people for. There's things that he wants us to know that are disciples of Christ that he gives us a preview of what's actually going to happen. And because he's given us this preview, He's designed us or he's asking us to live a certain way in expectation of these things happening. So Matthew 25 is in response to a lot of things Jesus says in 24. Next week, like I said, Pastor David Guzik would speak on that. But the one thing Jesus says is, hey, don't believe in false prophets. Don't believe everything you hear out there. You got to watch people you listen to. Many people will pose as if they know the truth. He says even there will be fake messiahs that are out there claiming to be Jesus. Don't get trapped. He also says that no man knows the hour or the time that he's coming. 
And so if somebody's posting a date, like, I think Jesus is coming at the end of 2024. That's not true, right? I mean, because he says, no man knows the hour. And when you see wars and rumors of wars, he says, that is just the beginning. And so knowing Jesus gives us this preview, how are we supposed to live in light of Jesus coming back? And I want to remind you, church, if you are a child of God, do you realize that Jesus will come back eventually for his church? Like, I, I, I hope that's just not new news. I hope, like, you realize that he is coming back for his bride. He's coming back to take us to be with him forever and ever. And so there's a lot to look forward to, but we don't know the hour. So Jesus gives a parable. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And as he's approaching the cross and the cross is imminent, you notice that Jesus' messages are getting more challenging. It's more true. It's more invitational. Jesus is trying to get everyone's attention. And the question that we have before us today is, are we ready or not? for the return of Jesus. That's the title of my message. Ready or not, he is coming back one day. So how are we supposed to live? So he gives this analogy. He talks about 10 virgins. And if you know Jewish culture and weddings, the virgins represent bridesmaids. If you've been to a wedding, you know there's bridesmaids, there's the bride, and there's the groom. And so the bridesmaids are not married. And in Jewish culture, the bridegroom was always something that the bridesmaids were excited about. They were getting ready. It would be unthinkable for the bridesmaids not to be ready. And so in this case, the bridegroom is Jesus. He's coming one day. And typically, typically in Jewish culture, the bridegroom would take his time to get there. But there was excitement on the other side. And typically, he would get there at night. So there's 10 of them. Seems like they're the same, but Jesus differentiates. Some are wise because they bring oil to light their lamp. And if you've seen a lamp, it's not a lamp that you would typically see in your home. It's a torch that is fed by oil that continues to keep the lamp burning. So he says, well, five bring enough oil to keep the lamp burning and five do not. And at some point we see in verse 6, the cry goes out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Let's see what happens with the rest of the parable. Verse 7, then all the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. In verse 11, later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, and I think these are some of the hardest words for somebody to hear, who knows the Lord but may not be in relationship with Jesus. He says, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. I got three points for you. They're all two-word points. They're very easy to remember. The first point simply is this. Be ready. Just be ready for the return of Jesus, because no one knows the hour when he's come, so you have to live like you are ready. He can come back later today. He can come back after service. He can come back 20 years from now. But the idea is, as a people of God, we need to be ready because he can come back anytime. Now, I, I want to just um, call out some special people in the house. Um, if you are 50 and older, raise your hand. There's some... some I'm sorry y'all don't think 50 and older is special. I get it, right? <laughs> but what I mean by, so 50 and older, everything hurts. You know, like when you get a certain age, you don't know. Things just fall off of your body. You don't realize. It's just like, come on. But here's what I know. As the generations get older in the body of Christ, 
The older generation is ready for Jesus to come back. Jesus, give me my new body. Jesus, take this. Like, as we get older, the inner man, the outward man is wasting away. You go, give me my new body, Jesus. But here's what I know. Every time I talk to somebody in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, they go, you know Jesus coming back. I go, yeah, I know. I mean, I know. He could come back tomorrow. I've been watching his blog. I've been watching the news. And you are hyped about Jesus coming back. I love it. It makes me appreciate the fact that he is coming back. But I want to say, is anybody 40 or younger in the house? Right? What I notice about 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, you know Jesus is coming back, but you're just still figuring out life. You got to raise some kids. You're just like... I know he's coming back, but man, I got to pay these bills. I got kids to raise. I'm looking forward to tax-free week. I mean, I know Jesus is coming back. (laughs) Why do I make that point? It doesn't matter where you are. If you're a child of God, you should be ready. And there's something about the readiness of the five wise and the five that are not ready. The five wise, what's the difference between them? They, they have the oil. They are prepared as if they know the bridegroom is going to come back. It doesn't matter how long. They're ready and prepared. And I would say what the difference is, is the five that are wise are devoted to Jesus. They have surrendered their heart to Jesus. They're in relationship with Jesus. If you are a child of God today, you woke up one day, the Holy Spirit opened your eyes, and you realized that you had to surrender to your Savior. He's the one that controls your life. He's the one that actually saves you, redeems you, and frees you. Can we give it up for Jesus and the testimonies that you have, right? So you have a testimony of the goodness of God. You're not perfect. But you realize that you're devoted to God. But I realize also in a church this size and in multiple campuses, there may be some of you at church that are just discovering who Jesus is. And so you don't know devotion yet. You come to church, you hear a service, and and the gospel goes out, the altar call goes out. You go, ah, maybe not this week. I'm just kind of discovering. I don't know. I believe in a couple other things. I don't know if Jesus is real. So some of you may be discovering Jesus. You know who God is, but you haven't submitted your life to him. You're, you're not in relationship with God. And, and I want to just tell you, it's It's more than religion, it's relationship. Can I just say, like, religious activity doesn't get you into the heaven, into heaven. Showing up to church, it's awesome. But showing up to church does not get you into heaven. Showing up to church doesn't mean that you are in relationship. And so I challenge you, if you're showing up for church thinking that that's sufficient, no, God wants a little bit more. He wants your heart. Because if you look at the story, the five foolish ones say, hey, give me some of that oil. And they said, nah, I can't. We can't give you some. You need to go buy the oil for yourself. So they go away, and the ones that had the oil were ready. And the application there is a relationship with Jesus does change everything. We know that. We say that in our church all the time but it's a personal choice. As much as I love Jesus, I can't give you my relationship with Jesus. That's, I am not the one that can save you. Know any preacher, know any believer that be next to you. You can have somebody right next to you that is on fire for Jesus, but it doesn't mean that person that's on fire for Jesus can redeem you. You have to personally say for yourself, I want Jesus for me. And so Jesus gives this parable, says it's a personal relationship. And many believe the oil that keeps the flame burning is representative of the Holy Spirit that indwells the believer when they profess that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And, and I did a little research. The Olympic torch is designed to stay lit. 
the entire time. And it's lit not by another flame. It's not lit by a match. It is lit by the actual sun's rays because they wanted to go back to ancient times and with a special mirror that actually lights the torch. And it stays lit no matter the condition. So I thought about this. The light that lights the Olympic torch is the S-U-N. But the light that lights the flame in your heart and mind is the S-O-N. And so when you have the S-O-N in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit, and he desires to light a flame in you. So here's the question. I just want to preach a clear gospel to you. Jesus died for you. We're going to even do an altar call at the end. And so you didn't have to die for yourself. He died a perfect death. Do you want Jesus? If you're not in relationship with him, do you want him to light a flame in your heart that won't go out? I'm talking to people that don't have a relationship with Jesus. We are so glad you are here. Online, we're glad you're here. Every campus, we are glad you are here. Would you allow the S-O-N to light a flame in your heart that doesn't go out? Because the flame that Jesus lights in your heart is not man-made. It can't be sustained by human strength. It can only be sustained by the, by the Holy Spirit. So I speak to the person that doesn't believe, but I also want to speak to some of you that do believe in God. And maybe you're at this point where the flame used to burn bright. But because of difficult seasons of life and storms and trials, sometimes the flame begins to fade. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Let's just be honest. Sometimes you go through seasons of life. It's tough. You're barely making it. Some of us, just to be honest, because the struggles get really hard. God, if you don't show up, God, are you paying attention? God, do you see me praying and crying out? And that flame begins to fade And how do I know this? Timothy in Ephesus was struggling with fear and doubt and discouragement. And Paul, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 said, said, Timothy, listen, I need you to fan into flame. I need you to blow some fresh wind on that flame. And some of you are at that point. You go, it's been a difficult season. I need that flame to, to burn bright again. Can I encourage you? Allow God to fan to, into that flame, fan into your heart, that flame that used, to, that used to burn bright. I don't know what's going on in your life, but, but God wants to rekindle that flame. This is what Paul was telling, telling young Timothy. Because in verse 10, it says, The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and then the door was shut. Now, here's something to look forward to. Now, I know we all have problems of life. We, some of us wish things were better. Some of us, maybe in life, we're on a mountaintop with God. Everything is going great. Some of us may be in a valley. Some of us may be getting out of a storm, going into the storm. But here's the one thing that gives me hope in the present is I know where I'm going to end up in the future. And if you are a child of God, Revelation 19.7 says this. The wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. I just want to tell you, what's ahead of us is way better than what's behind us. What's ahead of us is way better than present day stuff. Why? Because one day we will enter in eternity with God and there will be no more sin, no more crying, no more death. It will be no more anything but us and God. So we have so much to look forward to. Just be ready. Because here's the sad part. The others go away who were not in relationship with God. And when they come back in verse 11, it says the others also came back. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. So, so the sad part about that whole engagement is they know who God is. 
A lot of people claim to have knowledge of God. They know who he is, but they're not in relationship with God. And so he says, I, I never knew you. Now you'd have to say to yourself, we, we serve an omniscient God. He knows everything. But here's what God knows about each one of us and what keeps us from committing into a relationship with Jesus. Here's one thing God knows. He knows what draws you to him, but he also knows what keeps you from him. And many times in life, yeah, you're discovering uh, if God is real, and you ask yourself, well, I know God is real, but is he one of many gods? I mean, is he really real? Is he really true? I mean, I know I go to that church, they praise God, but, but I don't believe him for myself. And I want to just encourage you in a loving way, the door is wide open, but one day it will be shut. And God will say to you, I knew you knew of me, but you were not in relationship with me. That's why verse 13 says, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. There's still time. I don't know how much time, but there's still time. And so the question is, are you living like you're ready? Are you living like he can come back at any time? And if not, why not? Why are you not getting prepared? And here's the encouragement. I want us to live like we are ready. Because here's one thing that I know. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you should live like you're ready. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, God wants to get you ready. He wants to indwell you. Because here's what I know. Jesus may not show up on our time, but he won't be late. <laughs> he may not show up on our time, but one thing's for sure, he won't be late. And maybe that's a message that we all need to hear today. There's a God that runs this timeline that no one knows. And he gives us ample time to make those decisions so we can be right with him. So he gives one parable. He gives another parable about a master and his servants. Verse 14, it says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. If you are a note taker, the second point is really simple. Be productive. Simply be active. Right? Because... I believe that some of you are probably worker bees. Your work ethic is off the chain. I love you. The, even when you serve at church, we love you. Uh, so I love our volunteers. Can we celebrate our volunteers that serve Jesus? Some of y'all have full-time jobs. You have kids. And we can't do it without you. But let's be honest. Some of us are procrastinators. Anybody a procrastinator? Let's just, I'm not celebrating procrastination. I'm just acknowledging Sometimes we wait to the last minute, right? But there's this timeline. The master is God in this parable. And he gives of his resources to people that he's designed to do what they've been created for. And he gives the parable of this master who's going to go away. And he gives three servants according to their ability. And so he gives five bags of gold. Some people say, uh, the, in some translations, it's talent. He gives five to, to those that have the ability to do something with that much resource. He gives five, and then he gives two, the same deal. And he gives one. Immediately, 
the ones that receive five and two begin to work. And I believe that's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's something that burns inside of you as God indwells you. you. You get active. You say, man, I have to serve Jesus. He's showing me all of these gifts that he's given me. I have to serve him in some capacity. So you go and you work and you do these things. Not that you're striving or doing anything. All of it's to the glory of God. You can't help but serve Jesus. And so we see the servant that had five talents, had this ability, he doubles his efforts. The next servant, the same thing, doubles the efforts. And then you have one servant who had the least to be responsible for, although there was ability there because the one had ability, so God is not valuing the five the two or the one any differently. He's giving to them according to their ability. But here's what the one with five bags of gold, one bag of gold does. He or she gets a shovel. And I imagine in my mind, he's watching the other five, the other two servants go to work. But he takes a shovel and he takes the time to actually bury his gift. And he's not only burying what God has entrusted to, to him, but he's also burying passion, burying purpose, burying the potential for God to use him. It's burying dreams so much more, right? And so you wonder what is different between these two servants and the one that actually buried. And I, as I was thinking about it, I go, you could say, man, you know what? You just had one talent. How come you're not using it? But I realized even, even in the body of Christ, sometimes God gives you something and it scares the living daylights out of you. You go, God, I am not doing that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you begin to be afraid. You doubt. God, I'm not good enough. God, I can't believe you're thinking about me. Why don't you pick somebody else? No, I'm going to bury my gift. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why. Couldn't you have entrusted that to somebody else more talented than me? And if I was to be transparent, when somebody asked me to teach a sermon, I was like, why didn't you pick somebody else to teach? Well, I see this gift. I go, no, you don't see no gift on me. That is not, uh-uh, that's not my gift. That's for that pastor up there. And I said yes, but immediately after I said yes, I wish I said no. <laughs> so I remember my first sermon. I was shaking everywhere. There was nothing more in my body to shake. I was so nervous. And even up to today, there's still this nervousness that happens when I have to speak in public. And you know what the Lord says to me? Every time I speak or I come off uh, teaching a weekend or any one uh, time I might be teaching a point, every time I come off the stage or the platform, the Lord says, why don't you believe that I could do something in you that you think you can't do in yourself? And he reminds me and us, it's not about us. You think you're so limited so many times in God, but you serve an unlimited God with unlimited Holy Spirit, with unlimited resources. So just surrender the gift and say to God, well, if you want to use me in this area, go ahead and use me. Maybe for some of you, the encouragement is, no, 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 you need to go where you place that shovel. You need to go back, get that shovel, and dig up that gift. Why? Because God wants to use all of us. He wants to use the one that has five. He wants to use the one that has two. And he also wants to use the one that has one. So maybe the encouragement today is, stop being afraid. Stop looking at your ability and surrender to God. Because I love the... Olympics, the U.S. sent over 500 athletes. But here's the cool thing about all the athletes. They represent the same country, 
But not all of them run track. Not all of them play volleyball. They all play different sports, but they represent the same country. Can I just say, we cannot compare one person's gift to the other, but if you are a child of God, God wants to use you. Why? Because we all have diversity of gifts. He wants to use some in this area. He wants to use some in this area. He wants to use some in this area. But here's the cool thing. We all get to represent the kingdom of God together. Isn't that good news? So can I encourage you, use what God has entrusted to you. He's given you, a, he's given you ability. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Gender doesn't matter. Ethnicity, your background, your testimony, it really doesn't matter. God wants to use all of us. And I love this. God doesn't need us. In reality, he doesn't need it. He doesn't need us. It doesn't matter if you have a college education or not. God is, he's not concerned about that. He just wants a heart that's surrendered to him. He's given you ability. He's entrusted this ability to you. And considering how much the master gave, many scholars believe it was about 20 years worth of pay. Now, I thought about that side. Now, how many would love a 20-year advance on their pay? I mean, come on. It's like... Let's just be real, right? But I want to ask you this question. If you had 20 years left of life and you knew God was in it all of the time and you knew the very thing that God has entrusted you with, he's going to give you everything you need. So the thing he has purposed you for, you won't fail. If you had 20 years of life left, what would you do? What would you do differently than what you're doing now? If you knew God gave you this time and he gave you ability. Now I know typically when there's a call that goes out, when somebody wants to volunteer or, or we say, hey, the church, we would love you to volunteer. Hey, serve Jesus. It's a part of your faith and walk with God, there's like three things that, that tend to happen. You look at your time. We are a more busier culture than I have ever seen in my life. And so here's an opportunity to serve. You go, wait a minute, I got to look at my calendar. <laughs> and, and, it's, and I think about this as even as I serve God. I know I'm full-time vocational ministry, but in reality, you are full-time representatives of the kingdom of God. It's not only in church that you represent God's kingdom. In your community, you represent his kingdom. On your job, you, rec you, you represent God's kingdom. Right, church? Right? Like, but, but when you look at serving God, you, sometimes you might say, I want to serve him, but I don't have time for him. Maybe that's the tension that you live in. And if it's a reality, I know sometimes in life, depending on where you are, it, it is impossible right now. But maybe your, your serving is that you're, you lead a prayer group online. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you figure it out. The, the, the time could be a challenge, and then there's the talent. Well, how much do I do? How do I get started? Where, where you start, where you're at, how do I grow? How do I get equipped? Well, part of that is making time to grow in your relationship with Jesus. It's making time to maybe be a part of a group, to go to a discipleship class, to grow in your walk with Jesus, to refine the gift. So it's time, it's talent, and then sometimes your greatest gift to God, and it's for all of us, it's the generosity. It's what we give of ourselves to God. And our church is not after money, but generosity is, is huge. It helps us to actually do ministry. So it's not just serving Jesus in an area, but it's also how, do I, how am I generous to advance the kingdom of God? Now, we know at Calvary Chapel, we don't pass the plate. We put the tithe box you can give online. But I always say, if if God was, was saying to you and I, hey, out of every time you get paid or you get some sort of resource that I blessed you with, I'm going to let you keep 90 and I only desire 10. 
I think that's a pretty good equation, right? I mean, you get to keep 90 and generosity, you give 10. God has given us ability, but he also needs our availability. He's given us gifts, but he also wants you to not just identify the gift, but grow the gift. And maybe he's asking you to be generous. I don't know what it is, but what has he entrusted you with personally? The thing that, that speaks to you, the thing that resonates with you. What is that flame that God has placed in your heart? Maybe you're discovering it for the first time. Maybe you started and you feel like a failure. So you had the resource, you were starting it, but maybe things didn't work out and you buried it. And you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Why? Because it didn't work out. No, no, no. I encourage you. God has entrusted you with, with these gifts and he's given you time to be productive. So part of being ready is knowing he's coming back. But while we are waiting for him to come back, we're also productive in the thing that he's purposed us for. Yeah, you can celebrate that. And he uses us all. So the master comes back to settle accounts. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied. Now I wish, as we are about to read these next words, it was gentle Jesus. <laughs> Meek and mild. Look upon <laughs> these little children. But when I tell you Jesus goes in, these next several verses, you hear how he looks at poor stewardship or, or not doing the very thing he's entrusted us with. He said, you wicked, lazy servant. So he knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be neat weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's stop there. The last point is be faithful. Just be faithful. Just steward faithfully what God has given you. And the word stewardship is basically that you manage what God owns. And I want to just say as a news flash, I want to remind you, if you didn't know this, God owns everything. We don't own anything. Can I just break that news to you? Are you okay with that? I know some of y'all own your home, but in reality, God owns it. The car you drove in today, God owns that too. God gives us these resources to, to manage. So he settles accounts. And look at the excitement of the servant that he gave five bags. He's excited about seeing his master. Why? Because he's put to use what the master gave him. And so he's like, see, look, I, I, you gave me five bags, I produce five more. And what does the master say? It is everything that we all want to hear at the end of our respective spiritual race with God. Well done. 
good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a little. I will make you leader of over many things. Enter into the joy of your master. That's our eternal destination. The one that came with two, the very same thing. There's this mutual excitement. And so sometimes the very thing that we are afraid of to do for God is the very thing that God uses to fulfill us our entire lives. And notice the master is not saying you have to be perfect. If you read into the scripture, the master is not even saying, listen, because you doubled what I gave you, now you're faithful. He doesn't even care how much they're back. He just said, you have been faithful with little. So I want to just tell you, when God just wants you to be faithful, start small. Start where you're at. He's not asking you to do big things for him. He might grow you to that, but, but it's not immediate. The return, I don't feel, is immediate. I don't think the one with the five talents automatically doubles his effort the next day. It's 20 years. If you want to look at that analogy, it's 20 years. He's been persevering. He's been walking with God, and over time, he's seen his gifts grow, and it's the same with us. God gives you a little bit. He said, just be faithful where you're at. Maybe God has called you to be part of our family ministry. And you're just like, I don't know enough in the Bible. I've only been saved six months. I want to just tell you the answer that works in every children's ministry Bible study is the word Jesus. If you learn the word Jesus, God may be calling you to be a mentor. There might be gifts stirring in your heart. Hey, we need people in our youth. We need hospitality. We need folks in Celebrate Recovery and Freedom Groups and Teaching Connect classes. And, and sometimes you're starting small. You never know. You could be someone that's teaching the Bible study or leading the small group. You're just a part of the small group now. But God is like, I put you in that small group. Why? Because maybe in another six months, you're going to be leading that group. Hallelujah. And sometimes God stretches you. And so maybe for some of you, it's a start. Maybe some of you, you're too comfortable. And God is like, there's more I want to do. You're like, God, I'm good. <laughs> God, you know my schedule. Don't give me more to do, but I'm going to stretch you a little bit. So I wanted to say, be open to new things that God might be doing in you today. Be faithful where God has you and what He's entrusted to you. Because it's a whole different story with the one who does not use what God gave him. And again, my imagination, I don't know if he's nervous or not, but here's the thing. He knows exactly where he buried the gift that God gave him. So he pulls up the shovel and he goes, okay, he's going to settle accounts with me. And he digs up what he didn't use, and he gives it back to the master. He said, look, I didn't take any risks. I'm giving you back what you gave me. And to his surprise, the master says, you lazy and wicked servant. How come you didn't put it in the bank? Let it gain interest. How come you didn't do anything with it? And he said, I thought you were a hard man. And you realize, what's the difference between the servants that actually were active and the servant that was not active? The difference is relationship. If you're in relationship with Jesus, your heart begins to desire to serve him. If you're in, not in relationship with Jesus, you will see him as harsh or not gracious. But if you're in relationship with Jesus, you know you don't have to be perfect. You just need to be faithful with where you're at. So the servants know. God is not looking at your limitations. He's saying, just be faithful. But to the servant that didn't know God, he thought God was a hard man to please. And that's not God. So what's his fate? I would be like, Jesus, give him another chance. 
But he says, take the bag of gold from him, give it to the one who has 10 bags, verse 28. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Here's, here's what I, how I read that. God gives you and I ample time to fulfill what you have been created for. He gives you an ample time. It's, as they say, it's the day you were born and the day that eventually will pass, but it, what do you do in the dash? And here's the thing. If you're not going to do anything with what God has given you, then God says, well, I've given you enough time. I'm just going to take that away. Why? Because you don't want to use it. I'm going to give that to somebody else who desires to use what I've given you. And then his fate, because he's not in relationship with Jesus, is that his eternity is not going to be heaven. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is a literal, literal hell. Now, when we look at God and we look at everyone's eternal destiny, we all have one. Some of us will end up in heaven. Some of us will end up in hell. And, and I hope to God it's not any of us here today or any one of our campuses. Why? Because we preach the message of Jesus. So we're preaching hope to you every weekend saying you can serve, you can follow Jesus. So here's the question you will have to answer if you're not in a relationship with God. It's what did you do with Jesus first? And then what did you do with what God gave you to do after? Because many people will think, well, you know what? I, I deserve heaven because I've never committed a crime. I'm morally good. But the last time I checked, there's only one way to get to heaven. John 14 says... Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man gets to the Father except through him. So can we save you the trouble of risking the fact that without Jesus, there is no hope? And so many people look to God. I cannot believe God sends people to hell. And I would say that is not true. God sent Jesus so people could avoid hell. And if you desire not to, to serve or follow Jesus, then it's not God, it's you making that conscious choice for yourself. I don't say that to scare you. I say that because I want you to be saved. We want you to be saved. We want you to be redeemed. We want you to be found faithful. We want you to be productive. We want you to be ready. This is why Jesus died. We, we want you to be faithful with what God has given you. Now I'll end with this. There's a woman that I believe represents someone who has used her ability to really follow God and, get, and, and, and actually be faithful with what he's entrusted her with. Her name is Sydney McLaughlin Leveroni. I don't know if you know her. She's the 400 hurdle gold medalist for USA. You may not know her story. She's a believer in God and her husband's a pastor. So after she won the goal, she posted this. What an honor, a blessing, and a privilege. I never want to take these moments for granted. In a week where my faith was tried, my peace wavered, and the weight of the world began to descend, God was beyond gracious. It's always hard preparing for one moment you may or may not get back. In my mind, what kept repeating were the words, trust in Jesus. I didn't know what the outcome would be, but I didn't know he was who I wanted to lead me through the journey. What an amazing journey it was. It never ceases to amaze me how powerful he is to help those who trust in him to overcome the battles within. His word is sufficient. His promises hold true, and all the glory belongs to him. At the end of the day, it is far beyond winning a gold medal. She realized that God gave her this ability, but I love the fact that she glorified God in what God had entrusted her with. Now, I want to bring that home because I like to run, but I'm no Olympian. I just want to tell you, how many people like to run? Anyone like to run? Right? 
How many of you despise running? You're just like, I hate to run. So in 2018, I decided to, to sign up for a half marathon. And when I looked up the registration, I noticed for $10 more, you could run a full marathon. And because I'm very frugal and I want to be a good steward, I signed up for the full marathon. And I'm not thinking it's 13 miles more. I'm not thinking that because it's 26.2. I'm thinking, look how much I saved to run a full marathon. <laughs> but I didn't wake up one day saying, now I, got, now I got to train for 26. Whole nother beast. So I get up, I, I run hours and hours week upon week, eating the right food, strengthening my core, doing all the, making sure I'm hydrated. And then that day came, I run the race. And I got myself a medal for completing my 26.2. But here's what I know. When I looked up the the standings of who finished. There was a couple of people that finished in two hours and 30 minutes, two hours and 40 minutes, two hours and 50 minutes. You know what my time was? Four hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> but here's the, here's the thing that was really cool that I want to bring home. They finished before me, but we all got the same medal. It didn't matter. If you finish first. So here's what I thank God for. God doesn't take his cues from the Olympics. He's not worried about who gets gold, silver, or bronze. You just need to finish your race. And as long as you finish your race, you will get your reward from God. You just run your race. You finish it faithfully. As you run, you be ready in case the Lord comes back and you be productive. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, he says at the end of his life, I have finished the race. I have kept my faith. And he says, now when I walk into heaven, there's going to be this crown of righteousness that the Lord himself is going to give me. But he says, not only to him, but to all those that love his appearing. So guess what, y'all? If you are a child of God and you finish your race, you will all get the same crown that Paul got. The only difference is Paul got his first. But all we got to do is finish our race and we will get ours too. Can I get an amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you that we don't have to be perfect. Thank you that you light our hearts ablaze for you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, there's some hearts that need to be kindled. For the first time, or maybe it hasn't been kindled in a long time, Holy Spirit, would you would you blow fresh wind and fresh fire on your people today? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for listening to today's message. You know, here at Calvary, we believe a relationship with Jesus changes everything. And if you've decided to follow Jesus, we'd love for you to text the word BELIEVE to 31352 so you can find out what it means to follow Christ. And to learn more about Calvary and all of our campuses, you're free to visit calvaryftl.com dot org.